Welcome back to our circle of healing and recovery. The elders say it's important for us to practice silence. They say, whenever we get together as a group or as an individual, we should start by being still. I want you to take the next two minutes to get quiet and say a prayer to our Creator and ask Him to put words and thoughts in your mind which will help you focus. Welcome back to our Recovery as a Process, Not an Event series. In this segment of our workshop, we're going to be talking about what's commonly called the maintenance steps, steps 10, 11, and 12. And we said earlier that steps 1 through 9 will launch us onto a new spiritual orbit. We'll now talk about how steps 10, 11, and 12 together help us maintain that orbit until it's time for us to launch onto the next orbit. So let's begin with the instructions, as usual. And in fact, I think I won't go there yet. Let me talk about a little something I call constructive and restrictive motivation before we go specifically into the 10th step. And in a minute, you'll see why I would do that. See, we have a choice on how we operate our lives along a couple of different lines. And one of those choices might be called constructive, and another might be called restrictive. And this is how we motivate ourselves to change. It's also how we interact with other people. And many of us who end up in recovery fellowships have been raised in restrictive orientation. Now, how you can tell a restrictive orientation is there are a lot of conversations that include have to or else. Do this or get this. My way or the highway. Some of you might have been there. Some of you might still be there. Now, another way of interacting or getting others or ourselves to change might be to create a picture of a positive outcome that's so compelling that we can't stand not to have it. And we would be describing for ourselves and others what the pay value is of this particular path. That would be perhaps a constructive approach to motivation. So let's see if we can come up with a couple of examples here. Now, Sometimes people who have been raised in a variety of different religious environments get quite a lot of rules, and if these aren't followed, then you're going to hell. And one that's sometimes humorous these days, it probably wasn't uh, at the time, and it may not be to some people, but uh, in the people who are in the Catholic religion would know that years ago it was a sin to eat meat on Fridays. And if you did that, you were going to go to hell. But not too long ago, along comes a pope who decides that it's okay to eat meat on Fridays now. And you think, I was wondering, how would it feel to be one of those people who went the hell over this? I would be really irritated. <laughs> but, you know, that's a, a little bit of humor here. But what happens if some, in that period of time when the changeover was happening, it was not uncommon for people to say, no, you eat meat on Friday. I'm not eating meat on Friday. What if the Pope's wrong? I'm not going to take a chance on going to hell just because some Pope thinks it's okay. I know the truth. Right? See, in our mind, we set up the truth, and then our automatic pilot system causes us to follow that truth. So it's the truth that's programmed into us over and over and over again, is if you eat meat on Fridays, you're going to go to hell, then you certainly won't eat the meat on Fridays. It takes quite a lot of time for people to change that script, and many people who had that script didn't bother. It was a new generation of people who came up with a new script who look at that quite differently now. Now that, you know, we picked on the poor Catholic Church there, but how about inside of your families? You know, what kind of have-tos or else did you get as a child? You have to clear your plate or else you're not getting any food tomorrow. Right? You have to chop the wood if you're going to sleep in this house. Right? 
And a lot of families, particularly low self-esteem families, have a tremendous amount of have-tos and consequences. Now that's OK if it maintains a bit of order, particularly if you've got a house full of teenagers. And they're a bit out of control. And some people use, you know, this, this. But, but what, are you, what happens if you're an adult now and you're still running around with all these have tos? Some, did you know that some have tos that get programmed into people, that there's only one true and correct way to tend a toothpaste tube? It always has to be squeezed from the bottom, rolled to take up the slack, and the cap has to be back on it or else you're going to get yelled at, or someone's going to shape you up and tell you again how to do it correctly. Right? Now, marriages break up over these sort of little have-tos. The one and only true way to fold a towel. Right? The only correct size of a cookie placed on a cookie tin. Which kind of cookies you drink milk with and which ones you drink lemonade with. And on and on it goes. These are, these are instructions from childhood carried into adulthood and then inflicted on everyone we come in contact with. See, when we are raised with restrictive motivation, we spread it around. And we feel inclined to shape everyone else up too. Yeah. So what would constructive be like? Well, constructive is always painting the positive picture of what it would be like to do this because you want to, because you choose to, because you like it, because you love it. Why would I choose to study? Because if I study, I get better grades. If I get better grades, I have an opportunity to go to college when no one else in my family has ever gone to college. If I go to college, I get a chance to have a better job. That means I might not spend my life on unemployment and have no pension or anything like the rest of it. So there's a, there's a whole series of positive things that I would put in front of myself or others around the, the why this would be a good path. And then people are drawn to it or I'm drawn to it. Now, there's an automatic reflex that happens. If I were to walk over here in the studio now and, uh, and ask Joyce to hold up her hand, and, and she held it up like this, and if I were to push on Joyce's hand, her automatic reflex action would be to push back. She wouldn't have to think about it. It would just happen. Now, that same thing happens when we push ourselves around. When we tell ourselves, you've got to clean up your act. You have to stop drinking. You have to stop eating like this. You have to stop behaving like this. You have to stop. And inside of our creative subconscious, a little voice says, oh yeah, let me give you 16 other alternatives. I don't have to. I can push back. And we push back on ourselves. So if we're trying to motivate ourselves to have a positive, constructive, joyful, spiritual, growing life, would we want to use have-tos on ourselves as a means of motivating ourselves? Or would we want to use constructive motivation and paint a picture for ourselves of how joyful it would be, how positive it would be, how good it would feel for ourselves and others. Like some of the conversations we've been having throughout this workshop on what it might be like to work these steps. I think by this point people can see the payoff. Look forward to the joyful outcome. And that is a means of constructively motivating self and others. So let's now look at these instructions. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. The instructions for this are on pages 84 through 88 in the book. And they're quite detailed. They tell us to do a variety of things. They talk about a spot check inventory during the day. And it says, pause when agitated or doubtful. Now, why would it have that kind of instruction? Pause when agitated or doubtful. Well, when we've been restrictively motivated in a 
our life, we build up what are called restrictive zones. And whenever we behave different than the script, or when other people behave different than the script, it gives us a little shock, like, just like somebody jamming us. Oh, I wish they wouldn't do that. Who taught them how to drive? Where'd they learn to comb their hair? Don't they know how to tend a toothpaste tube? Who taught them how to vacuum? All these things, right? Pause when agitated or doubtful. Well, frequently when we're agitated or doubtful, it is nothing more than someone has just violated one of our restrictive zones that is tied to an old script that came from our family of origin, schools, churches, friends, family, life experiences. And it may be the silliest of things. So if we've gotten this far with these first nine steps and we're feeling so good, here's an opportunity now to bit by bit just weed out these little silly scripts that we're operating our life on. And the good news is the whole human race is there to help us see these things. All those drivers at the traffic light, they help us see these things. All these people who do it different than our script, they help us see these things. It's in relationship to others that we see ourselves. We see what our script is. So every one of these, what are we pausing to think about? We pause and think about, well, what is that? What's going on here? And there's this window of opportunities, about five seconds long, before we go into action, like telling them how to drive their car or tend the toothpaste tube, or whatever it is. And it, that five seconds is golden. If in that five seconds, we can actually have a little conversation with ourselves around, I wonder what that's about. What's that script they violated? See, it's not about them. It's about what is triggering in us and what's the script that they violated. Now, there are situations where people's behavior is completely unacceptable. And you'll know that after five seconds, or 10, or 20, whatever. There, there's some of those circumstances as well. But there is a real opportunity to use this 10th step and this spot check to do that. Yeah? Then there's another piece in the book, which is about a nightly inventory. And it has some very specific instructions, again, on what to do at the end of our day. When we retire at night, we constructively Review our day. Oh, nice word, constructively. It doesn't say restrictively, negatively, kicking the crap out of ourselves kind of look. Constructively review our day. Where during our day did we have things that weren't as we were expecting them to go? Where were we not being the person that we choose to be? And then some other things specifically. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? And on and on, there's several instructions here. And this is sort of a little checklist that helps us see if we are really becoming the healthy, whole, spiritually growing person that we've described in our step two vision, that we've now become, by the time we're in this tenth step, to a great degree, sometimes beyond, way beyond our step two vision. And this helps us see whether we're staying in the middle of being that new person or whether we're getting back in the edges of it again. And we always like to say that we learn by mistakes. It is not about being perfect. Every day brings us opportunities to see how we're doing and to grow if we choose. All of it is sacred, whether we're right dead in the middle of the person we choose to be and acting exactly as we've described it, or whether we're a little bit left or a little bit right, it's all sacred. See, human beings are like missiles. We are goal and picture oriented, and we're always seeking towards an end result. So to the degree that we can keep our vision clear, our picture of who we are and what we choose to be in front of us, and then we work off of a feedback system, which 
Every time we get stray from the target, we get some kind of feedback. Ooh, that's not like me. I didn't intend to have that word slip over my mouth. I didn't intend to be. And it, now we have an opportunity of how we talk to ourselves. We can either go into telling ourselves how stupid we are and how we're never going to change, or we can say, stop it. That's not like me. The next time, I will be like this. And we describe the behavior we would choose to have versus what has just happened. And we print in the new, and we don't overlap and reprint the old. Because we, we go to automatic reflex into patterns. So the patterns that are, are strongest will somehow determine where we go. So to the degree that when we're in the middle of this chain, we might find sometimes I'm over here, sometimes I'm over here. But the stronger and stronger we get the image and the picture of the new person we are, the more that will be the automatic reflex way that we think and behave. And we think, I wonder who that person was that used to think and behave like that. And haven't I grown tremendously from there? Not that I don't have some room to grow yet, because I'm still breathing. But haven't I grown tremendously to be here? And that's the sort of stuff we give ourselves positive feedback. And we take these aberrations, these points in time when our behavior and thinking doesn't match the person we choose to be, and we say, well, that's interesting. But that's not the person I choose to be. I choose to be like this. And we print it in, we print it in. And more and more and more, this is just the way we are. That's the tenth step in action. It's an action step that keeps us on the spiritual path. So we made a choice back in the third step to go along the higher power orientation. The work that we've done in the steps all the way up through is sort of defining what that spiritual path will be for us, how we will be in this higher power orientation. And this is a means of constantly checking and feeding back how we're doing. It's not about hurting ourselves, running ourselves down when it doesn't happen. It's about constantly giving ourselves positive feedback so we stay as close to the middle of it as possible. So after doing this nightly inventory, this tenth step, then I suggest that we do a little prayer. It talks about giving thanks to God for the day and what corrective action we should take. And there's really good instructions in this book on this tenth step. And it's the instructions for the 10th and 11th step are mixed together. So when you read the instructions for the 11th step now, you read the same pages, steps 84 through 88. But before I do that, let me talk about a character that maybe none of you have ever been, but I have been. This character is called the captain of the world. Yeah. Now, the captain of the world thinks it's their job to shape everybody up whenever they sort of get on the wrong side of one of these restrictive zones. So we're forever slipping into command position. And at the stoplight, I find myself three cars over in the wrong car in my mind, giving them instructions on driving, because they obviously didn't go to the school or whatever, all of these things. Now, the captain of the world also has another little habit. They're, they're, they're usually bankers. Yeah? They have a lot of IOUs. Well, I forgive you this time, <laughs> but chalk one up. And no, really, that doesn't bother me at all when you talk to me like that. Chalk one up. Chalk one up, chalk one up, chalk one up. And then one day, you come through the door, and the, your partner th is there. How was your day? Dinner's on the table, and you say, you're out of here. You don't live here anymore. <laughs> because you've been banking all of these things, and you just dumped it on them out of the blue. The captain of the world. Now. There's another way. You can, you can do it with teasing, belittling, sarcasm, all of those kinds of things. And all I want to do here is, in a funny way, again, 
keep us thinking about where does this type of behavior creep in on us? Where do we find ourselves using sarcasm, teasing, belittling with the ones we love, the ones around us at work, friends and family? When we see that creep up, recognize that we're, we're slipping into perhaps patterns of trying to correct other people for violating our scripts. And that's an opportunity to grow, to choose to let go of that script, to grow along the lines that we would choose to. So now let's talk about this 11th step. So the instructions for step 11 say sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him or the creator or whatever. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. You mean I can't pray for a million bucks? I've come this far and there's no gold at the end of the rainbow? Well, what it tells us is that's not the way to riches. Riches is peace of mind. Riches is living comfortably on this planet inside of our skin in harmony with God and our fellow man. That's riches. Now, there's lots of other things that might come along, along the way. But it's quite specific around the type of prayer that we would pray. And there's a suggestion in the book around when to pray and what to pray for. There's a piece in here on page 86 of the book that says very specifically on awakening. It doesn't say when you get around to it. It says, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. And there's a whole lot more in here about what happens when we do that, how to use a variety of different spiritual readings, prayer and meditation. It specifically says to uh, value what churches and religion offer, all spiritual paths are good paths, in other words. Take from where you can get it things that will help you grow along spiritual lines. Now, I like this because what it says is, if I take the time, first thing in the morning, to line my thinking and recommit that my will will be guided by the Creator, I am safe to use my God-given capability to its maximum capacity in this day because I will get intuitive guidance. And this magnificent equipment that human beings have been given called brains can be used for good, for service, for thinking up all kinds of interesting things to do, for work, for play relationships, and I can do that in confidence that I'm in line with a power greater than myself because I've made the choice earlier on to have my will in my life guided by this power, and I then recommit in the morning and ask for guidance. Now, I also, there are some instructions about thinking and praying during the day and some instructions for praying at the end of the day. I always try to end my day after having done this 10-step inventory with another check-in with the higher power. Thank you for another day of life, being a human being, growing, contributing, whatever's going on in the day. And then I start talking about how I would like my next day to be on a spiritual plane and asking God to give me grace and to help me wake up 
rejuvenated, growing along spiritual lines, dedicated to service, these sort of things. So I'm already starting to set up how the next day is going to go. Now, why would I do that? Well, there's something that's called a reticular activating system, which is a part of our brain that's right here at the base of, of the brain as it goes into the neck. It's a web-like net of cells that has the job of filtering in and filtering out information. And it filters in things that are of value to me or are a threat to me. And it filters out everything else as just a distraction. So it, for example, if I'm driving downtown and I need a parking place, when I get within the block that I need to park in, all of a sudden a little puff of smoke will come out of someone's tailpipe and I'll say, aha, there's my parking place. Now I might have just driven 20 miles and didn't see any puffs of smoke out of any tailpipes. Why didn't I see it? I didn't need to know it up till then. Right? But as I got into a window when I needed to know that, it's filtered it in for me. See? Threats get through as well. Some kind of a loud noise, something that there's, there's an impending disaster coming. Those get through, regardless of what's going on. Walking through a crowded airport or some public place, the paging system is going all the time. Let it say your name, and you will immediately hear it. Why is that? This system is working very well. That's why. Now, the reason I want to bring this up now is people who know about this get really lucky in life. And I'd like to give you some information that could help you get spiritually lucky. See, we can condition ourselves to be seeking on a daily basis spiritual growth and development that will help us be the person that we have set our vision for. We can deliberately set up our reticular activating system to be in harmony and alignment with spiritual laws, values, and principles, and to be constantly seeking for information or access ideas of what would help us be the person we choose to be. And it will filter that in for us. It'll filter out all of the other stuff. Now, if we don't do this, and if we don't do these steps, we, why do we continue to be the person we are? Because we're always scanning for information that would cause us to repeat it. That's what's of value to us, staying roughly in our comfort zone. What happens when we work steps is our comfort zone moves. And we now become more like the person in the new comfort zone. That's a significant shift for us. So part of why prayer and meditation work so well it's like locking in the power plug between ourselves and the Creator. And at the same time, we're setting up our God-given mental equipment to always be scanning for things that would cause us to be the kind of person that we've prayed for in the morning. It has a value to us now. We've declared it so. So we're using a combination of prayer, asking the Creator to give those things to us, and we're helping our own system that was designed to do this get it for us as well. Step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to fill in the blank, recovering people, variety of different fellowships, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Having had a spiritual awakening, it doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say you get a 20% shot at it. It declares it so. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we're now on a new spiritual plane. And it isn't as far as we can possibly grow along spiritual lines, but it's certainly some place that we weren't before we started these steps. And so the instructions for this are on pages 89 through 164 in the big book. Read and follow those instructions. It talks about doing a variety of service work. 
there's a myth in some of the fellowships, and you hear this thing said occasionally in some of the, the discussion groups, that the 12 steps are a selfish program. It couldn't be farther from the truth. The 12 steps cause us to let go of self, align ourselves up to spiritual laws, values, and principles, and find ways to be of service to God and our fellow men. And in return, we get incredible peace and joy. And the more that we do that, the more we get. So that's what practicing these principles in all our affairs is about. It's a demonstration that we are the person that we choose to be. So steps 10, 11, and 12 keep us on this new orbit until it's time to grow again. Now Don is going to come up and talk a little bit about seasons and cycles and how we know this when it's time to grow again and where we might grow to. So in this journey through these 12 steps, we've seen that steps one through three are in the east. That's about finding a relationship with the Creator, God, Lord, Jesus, whatever it is for you. Then you go to the south, steps four, five, and six. That's where you find yourself, by inventory looking within. And it happens that when you're looking within, as you look, you discover two things. One is the defects of character, or those habits that we have automatically develop that cause us to live out of harmony with the principal laws and values that we talked about. But also in there you discover the solution for that character defect. In step seven, eight, and nine, that direction of the west, that's where you go and you let it go. And in 10, 11, and 12, as Wayne just covered, that's where we discover the elders' thoughts, the maintenance thoughts to maintain and to grow. And as we do that, then all of a sudden we find ourselves what appears to be a new person. But it's really not a new person. That's who, that's who and how the Creator made you in His likeness. I remember for a long time I used to always make my Creator like a human being. So in a sense, it's like I'd figure out what would be nice, and I'd say, okay, God is a thousand times nicer than that. Of course, I get in trouble with a law, then I make the Creator a lawyer. I get in trouble with uh, money, then I make him a banker. I get in a relationship, I make him a counselor. So I was always making the Creator like a human being, but a real nice one. But through this process of the steps, we discovered that's not how the Creator is. Because I was making him in my likeness. And really what it is, it's the opposite. That we are really made in his likeness. That that creator is a spirit. And I think after we make this journey for a while, we start to see that the only thing that the creator ever made was everything was sacred. And that means everything is sacred. All the birds, animals, two-legged, four-legged, and even ourselves are sacred. Even our defects are sacred. If you think about it, our character defects is the very spot where we usually gain knowledge and wisdom of God's will. It's not when we're nice we don't get too much knowledge of God's will, but it's in the very defect, right in that place where the growing takes place, the place of the lessons. And I think sooner or later we come to realize, I like it, what it says in that book, it talks about purpose, about our true purpose. And it's sooner or later as we grow, I think we come to realize that our true purpose is to be of service to the Creator and help others. Sooner or later, we come to learn that's what it's all about. It's about serving the Creator and helping others. At home, there's these teachings they call the teachings of the warrior. But it says, a warrior, by the way, is a being name. That's not like TV. It's not like a... Um, a war word, it's a spiritual word, warrior. It's both someone who's both female and male, balanced. But in the teachings of the warrior, it says that every warrior has a song written in her heart, and that song must be sung before you die or your soul forever remains restless. What that means is that each of us is here for a purpose, and each one of us has been given a certain talent, a certain gift, given to each individual by the Creator, and you're the only person in the whole world can do that talent or that gift like you can. It's not duplicated. 
that each one of us has that. And sometimes that's what we search for, I believe, as we go through the sobriety, through the recovery. And it's about choice a lot of it. I remember when I first came in, this man that helped me in recovery one time, and I was at his place having some dinner, and he was cooking some things. And uh, he says, you know, he says, recovery is like a banquet. He said, on this recovery, you have steak and lobster, and you have like meat pork chops, you have hamburgers. And then as he was uh, making that, he was making a peanut butter sandwich. And he turned around, he gave me the sandwich. And as I bit into it, and he says, and some people in recovery, they have peanut butter type of recovery. And as I was chewing the peanut butter, he said, you know, the trouble with peanut butter, though, is it sticks to the roof of your mouth. And he was telling me about that realm of recovery that no matter where we've gone, what we've done, that there is a range that we can go for if we choose to go for it. And he used to make me angry sometimes because sometimes after that we sat in a meeting and he'd be sitting across the table from me and uh, when he would catch my eye, he'd look at me and he'd go. He was always like uh, ribbing me, but in a sense he was doing it positively, saying, what is it I want to do? Have peanut butter recovery or lobster recovery? Which is it to be? Because it's not something that you wait for somebody to put before you to see, are you going to luck out and get it? It's something you have to go after, that you choose to want this way of life, to like it, to love it, and to go after it. And then we also learn that we go through these cycles and these seasons. It's like when we come in, like our first four years of recovery. And I'll show you on the board here. We end up in that first cycle with a spring, with a summer, with a fall, and a winter. And we talk about that cycle. Then we also see that in wintertime, it seems like something happens. But we really go around the cycle, and we head towards another spring, another summer, another fall, another winter. Then we transition in that winter to years 8, 9, 10, and 11. 12, 14, 15, 16, that we actually not just travel in a circle that's continuous, but that circle goes around a bigger circle for a 16-year cycle of growing. So I think the question is here is, it's, what, do you, what do you want? What are you after? My experience so far that there is nothing that the human being could have experienced that cannot be corrected in recovery. I always have a lot of respect for these steps. I almost think now I have so much respect for them is I think that, I, I think this, I say, you know when somebody reads those steps, I should stand up out of respect, just out of respect for them. I believe that, that, that they are that powerful. But it's never done, you'll see. It's just a cycle system. It keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing, and then someday, Someday we die, we change worlds, we go to the other side. But really, the death isn't there because I believe it's the people who work to break the cycle in themselves, then you break the cycle in your children, in your grandchildren. And that if you make the correction and that you come from out of harmony to in harmony with, your, with these principal laws and values, then what you will notice is your children have no idea about dysfunction and your grandchildren will not, because spirit is always alive, it's always connecting. When you make the change in you, then this, that change goes into the children, and then they won't see it. You affect three and four generations based on the work that you do. Um, we believe that we are in a time in the world where the whole world is into a healing. And we strongly believe that these steps that we believe were given by the Creator to people who, for whatever reason, lived out of harmony. We believe these steps were given to help correct it. We think we will see these steps evolve and go around the world and touch everything. And we know that we need that now, that the world needs to heal. And I think this is just one of the processes that the Creator gave to us that is going to start that healing that will take place. It's dra dropping a pebble in the pond, and that ring goes out, and as it goes out, it touches everything, not just here, but for future generations. 
we realize that this program is not it's one approach. There are many approaches. It's like going to some town. There are many roads come to the same town. Some of them are gravel, some are interstate, some are walking trails. The point is, everyone is heading for that same place. And I believe the essence of that place that we are headed is seeking a relationship with the Creator. I think that's what these steps are about, is establishing that relationship with our Creator, or God, or whatever it is you call them. And so I'll just close with this prayer that I heard somewhere. And in this prayer it says, God, thank you for what you've given me. And God, thank you for what you've taken from me. And God, thank you for what you've left me. And I believe that what he left is a program of recovery, that a process of recovery that will take us on a journey. And this is more than enough. So with that, we'll say... Um, Look at the tape again and again, because uh, there's a lot of information on it. It's like being in jail. Say so maybe you were in jail. You sat in jail for five years. And then all of a sudden, one day, you reach in your pocket, and you pull out this key, and you try in the lock, and you find out all this time I had the key, and it was in my pocket. And the decision is, will you use the key or not? So thank you very much. Now is a good time to utilize a talking circle with your group. Focus on a subject which was discussed on the tape. Sometimes dreams are wiser than awakenings. Black Elk, Ogallaga. You must be prepared and know the reason why you dance. Thomas Yellowtail. Crow.